You're listening to the Listen Up Show podcast, show 033. Today, we're talking with business leader Stan Silverman on effective leadership and entrepreneurship. Stan Silverman is the former president and chief executive officer of PQ Corporation, which is involved in chemicals and engineered glass materials and operates in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. He is vice chairman of the board of trustees at Drexel University, a member of the Drexel Close School of Entrepreneurship Advisory Board. Stan writes a weekly guest column on effective leadership for the Philadelphia Business Journal. He is a former chairman of the board at Drexel University's College of Medicine and a former chairman of the Soap and Detergent Association. He has served as a guest lecturer on executive leadership at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and at the LeBeau College of Business of Drexel University, where he holds the position of executive in residence. Listen up, trusted friends. It's your business, it's your family, it's your life. Now let's get started. Hey, everybody. Mitchell Chadro here. Welcome to Listen Up Show podcast. If this is your first time listening, thanks for stopping by to the Listen Up Show podcast, which is produced several times per week for your entertainment. The show notes can be found at mitchellchadro.com slash show 033. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. Please sign up to my email list for the latest special offers exclusive for our Listen Up Show Startup Entrepreneur Podcast audience at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Again, that's mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. Our three sponsors today, HostGator sponsors our startup round. Audible, an Amazon company, sponsors our fast pitch. And Snappa sponsors our wrap up. You can also follow me on Twitter at Mitchell Chadro and Facebook.com slash listen up show. All links are in the show notes. Now on to our show. Okay, we're here today with Stan Silverman. Uh, welcome to the uh, the Listen Up Podcast show, Stan. It's uh, it's great to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you, Mitchell. Oh, that's great. Hey, can you can you tell me about a time where there was actually poor leadership? I mean, how were you able to turn it around and the lessons that you actually learned from it? Because I know that you you have a um, a website uh, on leadership, and that's what you do. Um, and so if you could tell me a little bit about maybe a time when uh, you saw poor leadership and, and what you did to actually turn it around and the lessons that you learned from it, that would be, that would be a big help to the audience. I think the most important trait in any leader uh, is tone at the top and the kind of culture that that leader establishes within their organization. And I've served on a number of boards, um, and um, I've seen leaders uh, who are very, very effective and those who are less so. And those leaders that are most effective have a very strong tone at the top and a very strong culture, which uh, sets the direction uh, for the people below in the organization and um, basically sets the course for the company. Yeah. You know, that, that tells us a little bit about, you know, what good leadership is. Um, but I think just as instructive as good leadership is, it's good to be able to sort of, you know, look back on a career and, and basically point out maybe sometimes when there was a struggle with leadership and what had to be done to basically change it and, and, and lessons that were learned from it. Uh, I think that would be very instructive as well. Well, let's take one that uh, has appeared in the news uh, most prominently over the last couple of months, and that's the situation at Wells Fargo where for the past five years uh, under John Stumpf, the uh, former CEO uh, within the consumer banking division, uh, there was a huge number of a huge amount of pressure on the people working at uh, bank branches to uh, create phony accounts uh, for their customers and sell them products that uh, they really didn't need, all to generate uh, uh, fees and revenue. And this went on and on for quite some time. And uh, finally, uh, it became public when uh, they were fined, uh, I think, upwards of $186 million. 
and uh, Mr. Stumpf appeared in front of Congress, and uh, he was ultimately asked to step down by the board. Uh, so this went on for quite some time, and I can only imagine uh, how the people down within the organization felt when he was making all these great statements about the tone and culture within the the, the bank. And in fact, uh, realistically or actually, uh, it, it just didn't exist. So that that was a very very toxic culture within the bank, and they're going to have some um, some issues and some a lot of work to do to turn uh, the culture and the tone around. You know, it's really interesting because I do a lot of uh, financial services litigation. Uh, where we represent uh, class actions and, and represent plaintiffs. So how do you how do you build that leadership culture where you actually have a high degree of trust and, and a true sense of teamwork among and between you know various departments and and, and, and teams within uh, a culture. Well, it starts at the top at the CEO uh, level, and it goes down to the CEO's uh, direct reports down through the organization. And um, the leadership just should not tolerate anyone who violates the tone and the culture that's set by the CEO. And, of course, that's overseen by the board, and the board needs to hold the CEO accountable, not only for financial results, but also for tone at the top and for culture. Um, I've seen a lot of examples in my career where the financial results uh, may look very, very good, but if the tone and culture isn't there, it's not sustainable, and uh, that CEO is, uh, you know, is eventually uh, going to uh, going to fail, and uh, that CEO will leave and they'll get somebody else. But you actually, but the, every board needs to hold the CEO accountable for culture and for tone. You know, before we jump into our next question. The Startup Round is sponsored by HostGator. For all our startups out there, for those who need to build a presence online from everything from web hosting to domain name registrations and help with designing a website, it's HostGator. Head on over to MitchellChadro.com slash HostGator. That's MitchellChadro.com slash HostGator. And start your plan today. Okay, now I read here that you were involved in a family business called PQ Corporation, and it was actually a seven generation company dealing in chemicals and engineered glass materials. And you're actually the former chairman of the uh, Soap and Detergent Association. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about that personal story with, uh, with both of those organizations? Yeah, certainly. Um, I've been very fortunate in my career in that I was given a lot of opportunity to do things which were new and different uh, and uh, which helped the company. I tried to differentiate myself vis-a-vis what I brought to my job and to the company, always trying to improve, and uh, that was recognized by management, and I was promoted fairly quickly up through the ranks. Uh, when I joined the company, I never intended to stay there. Uh, but I kept on getting promoted, and uh, they kept on paying me more money. So eventually I was made president of our Canadian subsidiary uh, outside of uh, in, in Toronto. And um, three years later, I, I came back to corporate headquarters as the president of Industrial Chemicals and then made CEO a short, or CEO, sorry, COO a short time after that. So I had a, uh, a very, very interesting and uh, satisfying, rewarding career uh, at PQ Corporation. You know, um, a lot of the entrepreneurs or, or startups or people that are trying to start something new are trying to come up with that business idea. And when I take a look at what PQ Corporation was involved with, chemicals and engineer glass, and, you know, being involved with soap and detergent, you know, it's kind of like how do they come up with good ideas? And, and sometimes – things that you wouldn't necessarily think of can be, you know, some of your best ideas. I mean, it could be styrofoam. It could be paper products. One of our guests uh, was a manufacturer of envelopes. So can you, can you talk to some of the entrepreneurs out there that are deciding to sort of get involved, but maybe they just can't quite come up with that business idea and talk to them a little bit about how there might be things, um, you know, that they can sort of do that, um, you know, could be as, as basic as soap. 
Well, we didn't make soap. We made the uh, ingredients for soap. Uh, we sold our products to Procter & Gamble, to uh, Lieber, uh, to Colgate, and um, all the soapers and, and folks that made detergent uh, for the uh, consumer and for the industrial market. Uh, and the way you, it, ideas come from everywhere. Uh, they don't come from the lab, just the lab. They don't come from uh, just the people in development. They come from customers. Uh, our sales reps and our developmental people were trained to speak with our customers about what they saw coming down the pike with respect to the needs of the industry and, and what the next trends would be. Um, we worked very, very hard to, uh, to translate that into products and into ideas. Uh, and I can, I can speak of, of one very, very successful uh, initiative which did not involve the soap industry but involved the catalyst industry. We produced a product uh, called the sodium aluminosilicate, which was a type of detergent zeolite that replaced phosphates in uh, the, all the boxes of Tide and, and, and various products like that. And uh, there was a need and a use for catalytic zeolites in addition to detergent zeolites. So we spent quite a bit of time in our laboratory uh, developing catalytic type zeolites. We joint ventured with Shell Chemical. Uh, ran a number of refineries all over the world, uh, and our first product was a hydrocracking catalyst that we tested out in uh, the Shell refineries. And then when we got uh, e efficacy data, we went to the merchant marketplace, and uh, we became a very, very strong supplier uh, of uh, catalytic zeolites worldwide in that in that market, which was very, very beneficial. Uh, to uh, to the company and to Shell, that joint venture was very successful. Working together with uh, with a partner, neither of us could have developed the product uh, uh, individually, but together we we made a great partnership and uh, were very very strong in in that market. So it's learning how to not only create teamwork within the team within inside the company, but also uh, partnerships and joint ventures and and knowing how to deal with other companies outside your, your organization. You know, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we work with are focused here in the United States, and from what I heard from you is you were involved up in Canada. I know that PQ had operations, you know, uh, outside the United States as well as Africa and South America. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about your dealings internationally? Because I think, you know, that, that's, that, that's quite interesting to, to our audience to, to learn more about. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Today, PQ operates in 19 countries with uh, approximately 55 plant locations around the world. When I joined the company, we operated just in three, company, in three countries, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And over the years, uh, we built out uh, our presence uh, across the globe. We had a very, very good name, well-recognized name. People would want to buy from us and partner with us. And uh, that opened up opportunities uh, for us to grow internationally and to add product lines. And so um, that's exactly what we did. And today, uh, to be a top competitor uh, in your, in your uh, space, you need to be almost global for the kind of businesses we were in. That's not necessarily true for, for entrepreneurs uh, developing products today, but uh, within their geographic uh, locality, but for us it was absolutely necessary to become global because the companies we were competing with were global and our customers were global. So in other words, uh, you know, if you're supplying them in the U.S. or Canada, they would say, well, can you supply us in, uh, in Thailand? Can you supply us in, in Japan, in Korea? Um, and can you supply us in South America, uh, in Mexico? And that's what we did. So it was necessary for us to go global, uh, not only because of the opportunity, uh, to uh, to establish ourselves around the world, but also because our customers uh, required us to do that, and our competitors were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And and tell us a little bit about uh, the. I mean, obviously, this is a family business, and when we say it, it goes back seven generations, can you can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because you know um, you know businesses come in all shapes and sizes. Some are public, some are private. Uh, some are some are generational like this one, um, and I, and I think you know it, it's quite unique, um, especially how large it's become uh, over over the generations. Can, can you can you talk to us about the family company from that? Yeah, sure. First of all, it didn't operate like a family company. We were all professional. 
Uh, we had a rule uh, that was put in place by uh, uh, family members, by the senior family members back in the 70s, that uh, no employee, or I'm sorry, no family member would be an employee of the company, uh, that the only representatives, representatives of the family would, be, would serve on the board. Uh, and they did that because if you're competing against the best in the world, uh, you have to attract talent that's the best in the world. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to attract the best talent in the world if they feel that uh, there's not going to be a level playing field uh, for, uh, for promotional opportunities because of family members. So we chose, or I shouldn't say we, but the, the, uh, the owners chose to go completely um, uh, per- professional, and that's what we do. We had a very professional board. We operated a board just like you would do in a public company, except we didn't have the reporting requirements that a public company would have. But um, we we operated very, very close to uh, to, to a, a public company type structure uh, in terms of uh, how we um, operated our, our 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 plant, how we attracted uh, a talent, uh, how we went to market with our products. Uh, it was very, very difficult to tell the difference. Now, you were actually why, there we were, over the course of 35 years, and, and, and looking at your bio, it says here that not only were you involved in engineering, but operations, planning, marketing, sales, um, you name it, you, you know, you pretty much have, have done it um, at that company. And so what, what advice do you have for the entrepreneur out there who's starting up, who might have limited resources, who needs to sort of bring in other types of talent, whether it be from a sales perspective or someone who has a technology perspective or someone who has an engineering background um, and, and doesn't have all of these skill sets? What, what type of resources are available to them that they can leverage? Maybe, maybe talk to them a little bit about that. Well, I would say that the first thing any entrepreneur does, they need to get an advisory group of folks, an advisory board of very, very experienced people in a lot of different disciplines within their industry to give that, them advice. And uh, when I speak with, uh, with a lot of entrepreneurs, and I, I do, I speak in front of a lot of classes for, of entrepreneurs, and I speak in front of a lot of business classes. And uh, you, you take a, 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 tw- a, a 23-year-old entrepreneur that's a year or two out of school, for example, and that person uh, is developing an idea, and they start have to they have to start staffing their company. That person that they hired, person number one, employee number one, is so critically important to them. They can uh, make or break the, their future progress based upon that one individual. Yet, they don't have any experience uh, hiring people or managing them, so they're going to need a lot of advice. Um, and so that that individual, that entrepreneur, is going to be facing management challenges and people challenges way beyond and way earlier than uh, somebody that, go, that graduates business school goes to work for Goldman Sachs and uh, works five or six years. Uh, basically, uh, for for one of the, the principals and doesn't have any managerial experience or opportunities to get it uh, until they're way into their careers, a number of years into their careers. An entrepreneur has to do that right off the bat, uh, very early on. So they need they need guidance from experienced people, and there's there's a lot of them out there. Uh, they're more than willing to help and make a difference in that person's life and, and business. It's a very satisfying thing to do. So they're out there. You can find them. Uh, but they need to get advice and guidance uh, until they build their own experience base. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can't buy experience. You can only get experience through time. And a lot of entrepreneurs don't have that time. They're, they're often running very, very quickly. So yeah. that's something that's very, very important for them to remember. Get advice from uh, experienced folks to help you, especially in the beginning. You know, you're involved in so many different things. That's why I was so excited to have you on because, you know, you're not just involved with, you know, um, running a business. I mean, you're, you're also a business advisor to, to private equity and venture capital. And, you know, you're evaluating potential acquisition candidates. So what, what are some of the main things that you're looking at when deciding to say, you know what, I want to take a chance on this particular entrepreneur or I want to go with this particular business idea, what are, what are some of the things that you're looking for? 
Well, that, that's really a great question. So I, I speak with a lot of CEOs of companies that uh, perhaps uh, we would like to buy. And, um, you know, I ask them a very important question, and it's really kind of an elementary question. I say, why do people buy from you? Why do customers buy from you? And uh, you would be surprised at the percentage that just have to think about that for a moment. Others kind of answer perfectly and they, almost immediately, and they're the ones who you want to talk to more you want to speak with a lot more. Basically, what I'm looking for is I want to know how the the, uh, the company that we may consider buying differentiates itself from the rest of the people in the market. What do they create that makes them a preferred supplier? And in fact, the best thing you can do is if you're running a company, you want to become the preferred supplier to your markets, which means that everything else being equal Customers want to come to you to buy your product or your service. Okay, they want to come to you to buy uh, your product or service before anybody else. So then the question becomes, well, how do you do that? How do you become the preferred per- supplier uh, to your market? And it's almost the holy grail. It's almost the holy grail of any business. You want to be the preferred preferred supplier to your uh, to your market of your product or your service. So the first thing you got to do is you got to offer high quality, reliable products and services so that uh, there's never a problem, it's always reliable, uh, and it's going to do exactly what you claim it's going to do, and it's going to outperform uh, what a competitor can provide. The other thing you need to do is you need to provide a great customer experience. Um, so you want, to, you want people to feel that when they come to you, you're giving them such a great customer experience, they're not going to go anywhere else. And this applies to, to every business, whether you're a physician, whether you're, uh, whether you're a hospital providing uh, medical care, whether you're a, a builder, um, whether you're an accounting firm, it doesn't matter. You want to be the preferred supplier and you want to give uh, your customers or your clients great customer experience. Uh, you want to delight them, which means that you want to solve all their problems. So uh, I used to ask customers, how are we doing? Uh, and they would say, well, you're doing fine because I never have any complaints from my people. That's exactly what I want. I want to buy from people that we have no complaints about. You want to be trustworthy. People will do business with people that they trust. If they don't trust you, you're not going to do business with them. They're not going to do business with you. You don't want to be arrogant. I would love, when I was uh, CEO of PQ Corp., uh, I would love to go up against an arrogant competitor. Uh, we would beat them every time. An arrogant competitor is arrogant to their customer. Yes. And they know they know best. They know best. They tell the customer, well, you really need to do it this way and this way and this way. We don't really care what you think, but we know best. We're gonna we just haven't convinced you that that uh, that we're right yet. Well that's arrogance. We don't do that. I mean I love to go up against those guys because you can beat them every time in the competitive uh competitive marketplace. And the other thing you need to do is you need to be on a journey to be the best in the world at what you do which means that you need to continuously improve your processes, your products, every which way you do business, and you want people who are dedicated to the philosophy of continuous improvement. And you want to empower them to improve their part of the business and have a sense of ownership in what they do within the business. And you want to give them expectations, and you want to cut them loose and let them do their stuff. And when you do that to folks that are very, very good, great things happen. And then you don't have to worry about them. You worry about other things. And so really uh, the, the universal principle that everybody can take away from that is, A, you want to build that competitive advantage, and really, B, you want to become the preferred provider in the market, in the space, and uh, you really want to listen to the, the, cu- the customer, obviously, and be confident but not cocky or arrogant. Right, and and you want to be on a journey to be the best in the world at what you do, which means you need to be committed to a process, a philosophy of a continuous improvement, and you need to empower your people to deliver those results to improve. Sure. You know, I, I saw that you were involved with uh, Ben Franklin Technology Partners, which is, uh, which is local here in Philadelphia, but uh, really in the tri-state area, and they're just uh, – a wonderful uh, organization. You're actually chairman of the audit committee. 
And then you also have another organization called Horizon Venture Group. So can you tell us how you got involved with both and and what you do for each and, and maybe just an example of, you know, a success story that, that you've been working on uh, with, with each group? Sure. Uh, well, I'm no longer uh, on the board uh, of Ben Franklin Technology Partners. I stepped down a year ago. I was chairman okay. of the committee for, for a year, and that's just a, a phenomenal uh, organization. They make investments uh, in uh, early-stage companies, and they have the talent within your organization to help those folks uh, move forward. And there's a huge number of success stories. Uh, Roseanne Rosenthal is the uh, is the CEO of that organization. She does a great job with her staff. Uh, Horizon Venture Group is my family's um, LLC. It's a it's a um, a company that we put together uh, to make private equity investments uh, when I left PQ, and uh, we made a number of investments. Some have done very very well. Some haven't, which is what you would expect. And um, it's uh, it's a way that um, uh, I can uh, invest uh, the funds and resources of my family in, in private equity, and that's what that is. You know, you do a lot of writing. Um, I know for the Philadelphia Business Journal, also uh, American City Business Journal, and um, we, we just had a, an entrepreneur on from uh, the Drexel Close School who recently graduated and has a company called Boost Linguistics that provides like a text editor for writers. And so what are some of the technologies that you're using as a writer, and how did you get involved with the Philadelphia Business Journal? Because there's a lot of writers out there who want to get published. They want to get started using the different technology out there. And, and so maybe hearing from you, uh, since, since you obviously do quite a bit of it and, and are already involved with, with some really good, reputable um, you know, journals, um, it, it would be interesting, uh, I'm sure, to the audience as to how to get started in, in that endeavor. Well, nearly three years ago, um, I was invited to go out to uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco uh, with uh, the staff of the Close School of Entrepreneurship and 16 students. And uh, I tagged along uh, as uh, the vice chairman of, uh, of the board of Drexel University and uh, we visited Apple, eBay, PayPal, all these uh, accelerators and incubators in San Francisco. We talked with dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs. And um, I got a, a chance to really watch our students uh, at Drexel's Close School in action. And I was just so very impressed with what they were working on as well as what the entrepreneurs out in Silicon Valley and San Francisco were working on. And so I'm flying back on the red eye um, from San Francisco back to Philadelphia, and I'm thinking, you know, the last time I was really challenged to do something new is when I was appointed chairman of the board of the College of Medicine at Drexel, where I had to learn the business of medicine. And that was three years before that. And I'm thinking, all these young people are doing all these great things. I need to do something different and great also. And so it took me a while, but I figured out that I would start to – I was very, I was a very good writer. Um, I've always been a very good writer. And uh, leadership was uh, an area that I really focused on during my, my career. So I started writing articles on leadership. Uh, I had them published on LinkedIn, and then I felt that I, I needed a bigger, more formal audience. So I went to the uh, publisher of the Philadelphia Business Journal, Lynn Kremer, who I had met, and uh, I said, would you like to have somebody like me write for you? I have a ton of experience, and I'm a pretty good writer. I said, would you, would you look at my articles on LinkedIn? She said, of course. So a week later, I speak with her, and she says, uh, you know, we just may may want you to write for us, but you need to meet Craig I, the editor-in-chief of the Business Journal. He makes the final decision of what gets in. So she introduces me uh, to Craig, and we have lunch. And I early on in our our conversation, I say, Craig, two questions. Uh, All my friends say I write pretty, pretty well, but they're my friends. He smiles. I said, well... Is what I write any good, and would you like me to write for your business journal? He said, yes and yes, just like that. He said, you can write once every two weeks, once a month. I said, no, I want to write once a week. I want to establish myself as a thought leader in the area of leadership. And he said, okay, well, that's a lot of work. Uh, if you want to drop back, you just let me know. But he says, you need to get an editor or two. So I went and hired two Drexel students uh, who work for the, the newspaper at uh, Drexel, the Triangle. One was editor-in-chief. And uh, I started to write, and they were editing my, my material. 
and I didn't use any technology except a word processor. So, yes. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I'm pretty good at that. And um, as of uh, the week before Christmas, I had 120 articles uh, published within the Business Journal or the American City Business Journal, which all that is is the parent company of the Philadelphia Business Journal. So about five months ago, um, the Business Journal syndicated me across the country. So I'm, in addition to the Philadelphia Business Journal, I'm in 42 sister publications in major cities across the country every Monday morning. Wow. And, uh, and I, write, I write my articles, and my editor is no longer Craig I uh, in Philadelphia. It's Ed Steich down in, uh, well, uh, in Charlotte, and uh, he edits me. He's very, very, both of them are very, very good. They've given me a lot of advice. Well, I'm going to uh, tell you what, I'm going to, we, you know, we, we're, we're going to certainly link to all of the, the show notes from today's show, but I, I want to also let you know that I've read quite a number of your articles on LinkedIn, and I thoroughly enjoy reading them. I'm not just saying that because you're on the show today, and mm-hmm. you, you have no idea how many, how many students, um, young entrepreneurs that are just getting started. They're, you know, Green Geeks, who's one of our sponsors, you know, they, they do web hosting. And, you know, they want to get started. They want to set up a blog. They want to write content. They want to write good, impactful content where it's going to bring people to their website. And they're always constantly asking me, what's the best way to get started? And so that was one of the reasons why I also wanted to have you on because, Again, um, this, this really kind of hits home to a lot of a lot of students and a lot of entrepreneurs who you know want to want to get started uh, and and become successful at it like yourself. Yeah, what well, I write on I write on leadership, entrepreneurship, and corporate governance, and I interview people. Um, I interview uh, and I write about them. I write about situations such as the Wells Fargo or the Volkswagen situation, where they were cheating on their emission uh, control equipment. Uh, I write about uh, very successful entrepreneurs, uh, uh, such as the uh, the young entrepreneur that start, started up Hip City Veg. I don't know if yep. you're familiar. I just I just read that article uh, just the Nicole other day, Mar- actually. Yeah. Nicole Marquis. Yep. Uh, she was the keynote speaker at Startup Day at the Drexel Close School uh, event uh, about a month or so ago. And um, and I also I get a lot of commentary and a lot of questions and a lot of requests by students to see me and I see them if if a student wants to talk to me I'll have coffee with him at uh, at Starbucks on Drexel's campus for a half an hour forty five minutes so I never turn a student down who wants advice my purpose in life today is to help other people be successful and to make a difference in this world and that's all I do. That's well, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm excited that, that we're having you on because, you know, I started the Listen Up show and the, uh, the Startup Entrepreneur podcast to really also give back to the, to the student entrepreneurs, to the young serial entrepreneurs. And we've, of course, interviewed a number of, uh, close school entrepreneurs. And we also had, of course, Damian Salas on, the dean of the close school. And we've also reached out to, uh, Donna. D. Careless, who, who we're also going to be having on um, later this month. So uh, we're, we're really thankful that we're able to have you on. Uh, are you able to, to stick around and, and answer just a few additional questions here as we, as we move into our next round? Of course. Great. No, no, I, I really appreciate that very much. You know, one of the things that I was also going to bring up and you had also mentioned was being that you were involved with um, – you know, not only as being vice chair of the board of trustees here at Drexel, but that you got involved in, in the College of Medicine, and so you had to learn a whole new area. And, and some of our entrepreneurs obviously are doing that as well. They're learning new areas. You had mentioned that you were very impressed with all the young, talented entrepreneurs and students, but one of the things that I was very impressed with when I was reading about your bio was the leaving a legacy and the importance of that. So when I actually read that you actually donated $2 million to the Close School of Entrepreneurship, I, I was so impressed by that because it truly is giving back and sort of walking that walk and talking that talk. So, you know, I think that that says uh, volumes for who you are and, um, you know, we're, we're really thankful that, that, you, that you decided to come on and answer a few questions. The Fast Pitch Round, which is our next section, is sponsored by Audible. We learn our guests' favorite books and my favorites 
at Mitchell's Book Club back at MitchellChadro.com. With Audible, you can listen up to your books while you're on the go by going over to MitchellChadro.com slash Audible. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E, MitchellChadro.com slash Audible. Start your free 30-day trial. Listeners of the Listen Up show get one free audiobook download. If you don't like your book, they'll exchange it for you. You can cancel at any time. Your books are yours to keep. You can choose from over 180,000 bestsellers, new releases, classics, and more. I recommend The Last Lecture by Randy Posh. Dream, be inspired, listen up, and get a lot of wisdom from those audiobooks. Again, at mitchellchadro.com slash audible. These are just really Fast questions with fast answers. So, Stan, can you tell us the best business advice that you've ever received? Oh, the best business advice. Uh, differentiate yourself. Be different than everybody else uh, because that's what's going to get you into the next interview uh, and make sure your resume reflects that. And so don't be like everybody else. Be different. Be different. Can, can you tell us some of the company yeah. that, you, that you're working for because that's what your next employer is going to buy when they hire you? Can, can you tell us some bad business advice that's being given to students, entrepreneurs today? Oh, my What God. to look out for? Bad business advice. Okay, if you're an entrepreneur, you, you need to look, you look out for two things. Uh, as, you're, as you're bringing on investors, uh, you need to watch for dilution and for being preferenced out. So that's not a real problem when your company is uh, is doing very, very well and every round is an up round. Uh, but if your company is lagging in terms of performance and you have to raise money, uh, the next investor is going to require you to concede, uh, concede some things that you may not want to concede with respect to uh, control and with respect to ownership. And so uh, you just need to be aware of that. How about a quote or a mantra or something that you would put right up there on a billboard that kind of motivates, inspires people? Oh, that's an easy one. Good is the enemy of great, which is the first six words uh, in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, which means that if your organization thinks that they're good enough, they'll never become great. And you never want to claim that your organization is great because then people will believe that you're great and uh, you have no place to go but down. You are never great. You're always working towards greatness and it's up for third part, it's up to third parties to say that you're great and your response should be, well, we're not quite there yet. We're working on this and we're working on this, on that. Well, you never claim that you're great. Well, I'll tell you what, you, you kind of stole my thunder on the next question, but maybe you can give us a double. I was going to ask you a very good, whether it be a business book or a personal book that you can recommend. That's a terrific book. I knew exactly where you were going with that. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe mention something, you know, another book that you can throw out there that's kind of helped you through business, and it could be business, family, or life. Oh, God, I'm going to have to think about that for a moment. Hit me with the next question. <laughs> that, that's fine. How, how about an app that, that helps you in, in business, family, or life? Again, it's, it's something that could maybe help you productively or, you know, that, that you find uh, that, that has been very helpful to you. Um, an app. Um, I have a lot of apps which allow me to read about what's happening around the world, social, uh, social and political. Uh, and that Which can one be, do you like? It, it, uh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I, read, I read probably 10 or 12 newspapers a day on my iPad, and I do that through the apps of, uh, of for example, the, obviously, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the London T Financial. Uh, I read uh, papers in the Middle East. I read pe uh, papers from the U.K. I read pe papers from Australia and from Canada. And it gives me a, a, um, just a, a, um, a, a window on the world. And, Do you use uh, one aggregator to sort of bring them all together because you're you're dealing with so many different no. sources? No, I just have the apps on my the, the icons and on so my. So you just uh, go to each one individually. Yeah, yeah, and what that does yeah. also it gives me a break. Uh, it just kind of rests your mind, and you, you can't focus on business all the time. Sure, because it'll drive you batty. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so you need so the way I rest and the way I kind of relax is by reading about what's going on in the world. 
How about how about um, how about a, 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 an item under a hundred dollars that has been the most impactful to you? Uh, under a hundred dollars, um, I can't think of anything under a hundred dollars. You know, obviously my iPhone and my iPad are the the most valuable things that I carry along with my communication equipment, um, and that that's extremely valuable to me. No matter where I am in the world, uh, I'm plugged in, and so and let me make let me just kind of uh, share something with you. I've been in uh, China, I've been in uh, Korea, I've been in Europe um, uh, over the last three years, and I've never missed communicating with my editors, or I've never missed a deadline submitting an article to the business journal uh, for publication, no matter where I was in the world, because all my communication gear is top-notch and up to snuff. And so before I go anywhere, I just make sure that I can communicate with the world every, every moment if I have to. The and that's through stop. your your iPhone and your and your iPad. My iPhone, my iPad, and my laptop. The world doesn't stop just because you happen to be in Shanghai or in Seoul, Korea, or uh, in a, in a small city in Belgium. The world doesn't stop, and so I just feel I need to be connected, and I've never missed a deadline because of that. Our wrap up is sponsored by Snappa. Snappa, they sponsor the wrap up. Snappa is a product you will love, like I do, and thousands of other marketers, startups, and entrepreneurs around the globe. Join our sponsor and wonderful resource. Add it to your personal or business program. As a Snappa user, you'll be hooked for life and a happy customer. Now, here's why. Snappa is the fastest way for you to create graphics. And you want it to be incredibly easy to whip up graphics for your social media, blogs, ads, and more without the need for Photoshop or the help of having to hire your own graphic designer. Here are just a few highlights of what Snappa has to offer you, my trusted friends and loyal listeners. One, they provide a fully featured graphic editor that's incredibly easy to use. Two, a stunning library of HD photos, graphics, and font. Three, professional quality templates already created for you by the Snappa team, and you are fully taking advantage of their own in-house designer. Four, now this is one big, huge advantage. It magically resizes your best graphics in just two clicks. Five, save and organize your designs into folders. And six, schedule and share your graphics instantly on social media snappa a resource head on over to mitchellchadro.com slash snappa that's s-n-a-p-p-a again that's mitchellchadro.com slash snappa and start your plan today stan how can people stay in touch with you because we we thoroughly enjoy this and um, it sounds like you really give back to the community that you serve and i know that there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are either struggling or they don't know exactly the next step. And I know that they're going to get a lot out of this interview in certainly wanting to, to stay in, in communication with you. Well, let me, let me suggest, let me suggest uh, that they read my articles each week on LinkedIn. You can just find me easily, uh, understand Silverman and you'll, you'll um, probably the first or second one that comes up. Uh, and read my articles, and that's a good way to stay in touch with what I'm thinking. Uh, if you really want to have a conversation, send me an email through LinkedIn, and I'll respond. I always respond to emails. Great. And we're going to have all, all, of that, all of those links and everything back at the, uh, at the website. And, and Stan, in closing, can you leave us with three main lesson takeaways that people can take away from what you can provide um, one, yeah, uh, number, num- number one, uh, be passionate about what you do Two. There's so many people in this world that for the next 40 to 45 years after graduation, they don't like what they do and they never make a change. And so be sure, no matter what you do, be sure that what you do is fun for you. Also, don't be afraid to take a risk and step out, uh, and do something new and different. You may fail. But so what? You'll pick yourself up and you'll, uh, you'll try it again. Uh, and if you never fail, you've never really done anything. You've never really done anything. And the last point, number three, is always differentiate yourself, your company, 
And so people will, when you, when you go and make a sales call to sell a service or a product, uh, the potential customer or client is going to say, well, why should I buy from you? And then you have to have that answer. And the answer is you, di- you differentiate yourself for those things that are important to your customer or your client, and you're always on a journey to become the preferred supplier or provider of the, of the service or the, uh, the product that you offer the marketplace. Stan Silverman, there were so many value bombs in this interview. You are a true mensch, and we just want to thank you so very much for coming on the Listen Up show, the Startup Entrepreneur Podcast. Again, thanks again, and you are always welcome to come back and stay in touch real soon. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, you take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. Sign up for our Listen Up email list. Get all the latest resources, advice, practical tips, and show notes by heading on over to mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. If you've been a regular listener of the Listen Up show, we want to thank you very much for all of your support. Please consider giving us a written review on iTunes by heading on over to mitchellchadro.com slash iTunes. It really does help encourage, inspire, and motivate others to start up and allows them to also find the resources and, and advice that they need to get started. So again, that's mitchellchadro.com slash iTunes. It literally will take you two minutes to give us a written review, and we really appreciate it.